Mike, just take a couple of minutes to get more of that background of where they're from, who they are, and how they got started on this journey. Hello, my name is Wayne Ross. Can you hear me good? My name is Wayne Ross. I was born and raised in uh, Petersburg, Virginia. Um, I was a hardhead in uh, middle and high school, but uh, I always knew I wanted to go to college. I did not know what I wanted to major in, but my favorite uh, subject was history. Uh, thinking, okay, I have to go to college, what am I going to major in to actually have a job, you know, making enough money to do what I want to do, which is basically, you know, take over the world. But, <laughs> but um, I decided I might give um, political science a shot. If I like history, I have to be interested in, you know, if I'm going to learn about past uh, leaders, then I should uh, also uh, be interested in current leaders, right? So I went off and, uh, to Old Dominion University in 2008. After graduating Petersburg High School, and uh, I majored in uh, I majored in political science and got involved in a community service uh, organization on campus. So uh, after my first year, I actually spent time in uh, Charlottesville. Uh, I uh, uh, completed a program at UVA called the Sorensen Institute uh, for uh, um, politics. So I actually remember, you know, being here. It was. A couple, it was too many years ago now, but you know I remember the streets passing. I was here for about one or two months uh, during the summer of 2009. It's good to be back. Thank you for having me back. Uh, so I completed my uh, education at Old Dominion University. Uh, right after I finished my my uh, summer program here in Charlottesville, I interned six months later for Senator Yvonne B. Miller. Senator Miller was the first African American female elected to the House of Delegates, and then the first African-American female elected to the Senate of Virginia. And um, I got really close to Senator Miller. I was, some may uh, consider me to be her protege. Uh, she's an excellent person, but unfortunately she passed in 2012 when I was graduating. Uh, so when I graduated, a lot of people thought I was going to go on work for Senator Miller, but when I graduated, she passed. I took a fellowship at the governor's office uh, under Bob McDonald, who actually <laughs> right after my fellow, right after my fellowship, I started as a legislative assistant in the General Assembly for my opponent <laughs> that I'm running against now. He was my former boss, so uh, I uh, served as a legislative aide and made my way to D.C. Uh, worked for a few lobbying firms and uh, went to George Mason, where I received my Master's of Public Policy. Uh, after I graduated from George Mason, I concentrated in economics at George Mason, and I te taught at Northern Virginia Community College for about three years. I taught micro and macro economics, which, which was definitely an experience. It wasn't for me, though. It wasn't for me. Um, I never wanted to be a teacher. That's why I didn't major in history. Uh, but I did learn a lot, uh, particularly uh, the thought process of young people you know, getting engaged in their community and trying to... Uh, gain an education so they can be successful in their life. I think that really gave me some insight that I use uh, when uh, looking to represent you know, my community. Um, came back, I, uh, the governor appointed me to the Board of Occupation, Occupational and Professional uh, Leg Regulation, which uh, is a policy board for setting the number of hours uh, a barber has to study before they can get their licensing and other occupation uh, in Virginia. Uh, I was appointed to a four-year term by uh, Governor Terry McCullough. We'll get into that later. Um, <laughs> but I recently stepped down uh, earlier this summer to run for state senate, so here I am. I am trying to be a champion of my community, and push entrepreneurship, um, and uh, of course, Lord of Crime Week, but I think we have to do all of that by, you know, giving economic uh, empowerment to, you know, a community that has been and proven to be disenfranchised and uh, stuck in a gerrymandered uh, district. So now we have new opportunity available for my community, and I just want us to get all that we are owed out of that. So that's why I'm here running today. And thank you for having me. And, uh, for those that don't know as well, Wayland's um, uh, 16th district is uh, Richmond and Petersburg. The cities of Richmond and Petersburg, correct? 
Richmond and Petersburg, parts of Richmond, all of Petersburg, all of Hopewell, and parts of uh, Dinwiddie, Prince George, and Chesterfield. And, um, and so next we have uh, Mr. Elliot Harding, uh, who's 25th district is Charlottesville and Albemarle. Awesome, thanks. And I want to thank Waylon for coming up here uh, right now. Before I jump in, let me tell you, uh, I, reach, I reached out to Waylon, I guess, maybe one or two weeks ago. Uh, I've been paying attention to his race because uh, we're both 29 years old, we're both running as independents, uh, we're both the only uh, competition to kind of entrenched establishment uh, Democrat folks. And so um, I was paying attention to his race, and it, for a while I thought the, the party apparatus wasn't necessarily going to jump into his race. I thought that they were going to let him have a fair shot given his record with uh, Senator Miller and you know, having worked uh, in the General Assembly, I thought they were going to kind of favor Wayland because the Democrat nominee's got a, somewhat of a sully pass down in Richmond. And, and, and so uh, I, I, was, I was disappointed to see that the uh, Democratic Party was going to clear $125,000 of his campaign debt, his opponent's campaign debt, uh, in order to make sure that he won. And so when I saw that, I was really... Uh, disheartened and I, I've been paying attention to his platform and the things he's running on and I saw it, it touched a lot of things I'm running on here in the, in the 25th district and I thought you know what let's band together and let's kind of try to elevate that voice so I really appreciate you coming on uh, coming up here today and making the ride I know that Petersburg and Charlottesville uh, are very different but they got a lot of similar uh, talking points right now too so thanks for coming up um, as far as I'm concerned um, I'll be quick. Uh, I'm born and raised here in, in Charlottesville and Albemarle. Been here my whole life. I went to high school here. I went to the University of Virginia for undergrad. I got cousins here, family here, parents here. Everybody's here. And I love this area. I tell people win or lose, I'm not going anywhere. Um, I've lived in this district uh, eight, uh, all my life, 80% of the district all my life. Um, you know, we got Nelson County in it. I went to law school down in Washington and Lee and Lexington. So all of Rockbridge County is in it. And then uh, there are several other counties. There's Bath, Highland, and Allegheny as well. And uh, I've got a lot of family in those areas too. So in the places I haven't touched, uh, I've got a lot of perspective on it. And it's very important to me. But I, I think that uh, I take a lot of pride in it because it's the birthplace of American independence. Um, you know, and, and America's got a very uh, long and detailed history, but we're always trying to move in the best direction for independence. And um, that's something that... I've been passionate about since a kid. You know, Waylon mentioned he was a, a, a history buff. It's hard not to be a history buff in Virginia because we got so much of it, you know. And so with that, um, I, I think we've kind of got at a standstill in Virginia. I think the two-party apparatus needs to be broken up. I think that uh, it's pit people against each other in ways that uh, our best interests aren't being uh, pursued. And uh, my whole platform, people ask me what's my platform, I mention all those counties in the city. It's so diverse. What happens in Charlottesville is totally different than Highland County or Allegheny County. But the things I'm most passionate about are criminal justice reform, number one. That's what I do for a living. I'm a criminal defense attorney. I've had family go through the system. I've had family in law enforcement. I've kind of seen it all. And I think it's the place where people lose their voice the most. Whether you actually lose your vote, you lose your liberties, but you know, the parent of a defendant loses a little bit of time, they're anxious, they lose those resources. A child who loses their father or their mother in the time and loses a maybe a two income household or a strong parental relationship or time. And then of course a community can lose, you know, an institutional person or somebody that could be a breadwinner or somebody could be some type of positive figure. And so criminal justice is my number one issue, but also um, you know empowering folks to be able to work for themselves. And that's one thing we were talking about earlier today. Uh, I want to see schools. I want to see skills put back into our schools. I, I, I am running on the idea. I think it should be mandatory to graduate from high school with some type of Class C license or an occupational license of some sort, because at a minimum, um, it can't hurt to know these things. If I have to know a language or I have to go to an art class, I think it should have to come out being able to earn money with my hands and, and my mind rather than having to go out and get a four-year degree. Now, it's not to say four-year degree isn't valuable. I wouldn't be where I am without one. You probably wouldn't be where you are without one. But there are a lot of folks who, um, you know, are, are stuck either pursuing that path and getting a bunch of student loan debt and not getting a job that needed a degree, or they pursue something that they don't have the skills. So I think skills are very important, 
and uh, we got some folks here in the room I know who uh, just started their own uh, HVAC company. And um, we were saying earlier, this isn't just about us. We want to hear y'all's perspective too. So skills, criminal justice reform, education reform. I think the SOLs have uh, kind of ruined the curriculum here in Virginia. We've gotten incrementally uh, more standardized. So it really discourages critical thinking. Um, it becomes a series of fact-based tests, not always the most fair tests. Disproportionately, uh, the results don't necessarily favor folks that you know, might have a different learning style or behavioral issues or family issues or they want to go somewhere else and, and specialize in different curriculum or something like that. I think we should have more choice and more autonomy in the system, not just public to private, but it could be charters, it could be uh, public to public. You might want to go to another public school in the area, things like that. Um, I think that our, our education system needs to be reformed. And then um, we were talking about business development, and I want to get back, I know we're going to get back here too, but I think Virginia and Washington, D.C., but Virginia, if you look at the top donors to both parties, four of the top five are donate to the same two parties. Dominion is the top donor to both parties. You know, and after that, you get into the beer and wine wholesale companies who run the ABC, you get into Altria, you get into these different companies that are running the system, because they don't like competition necessarily, and they want to be able to favor themselves uh, over maybe upstarts and startups and small businesses and entrepreneurship. And so what I want to see is a more free market system so that folks can start their own business and they can grow and they can expand, particularly in areas where they haven't had the opportunity to do so. Thank you. Thank you. Give a round of applause, please. <laughs> it's, it's, it's definitely good to know where you, where you stand. Right, so now, now we're going to uh, dig into uh, to a few topics and um, and then, like I said, we will have time for the Q and A as well. But the first topic that um, that I want the candidates uh, to touch on is a uh, minority business growth. Minority business growth. Um, and I, I was sharing with, with Waylon. I'm not as well versed on the statistics in Richmond and Petersburg, but, but I know we have some similarities and some differences. But as far as Charlottesville, we um, comes to business growth. We we hover around a, a, a three percent um, unemployment rate. Kind of fluctuates around that. Um, of course, as we know, the majority, 70-some percent, um, are, are those of um, are white Caucasian. Um, and then next, it drops all the way down to around 18 percent for black. Um, and so then, you know, down from there, Asian, Hispanic. Um, so part of what happens with, with businesses, gentlemen, is that uh, a lot of people look at these, these areas and uh, what, what's called black flight may happen. When we talk about minority business people think they need to go to a larger market to make it. Or we have things here like the Chamber of Business Diversity Council, Black Professional Network, New Hill Development. Uh, we have the, the Charlottesville um, uh, Fund as well that, that, has, that has a project to help build up minority businesses. So my question to you then is uh, why would those loans from the city and those um, special interest groups for minorities be needed? And what are your plans to help put minority businesses on an even playing field? It's hard to talk about these issues and islands, really, because they tie into one another. But when you have decades and decades of discrimination uh, in our criminal justice system, it's pretty easy to point to why you have 18% unemployment among African Americans and 3%, which is basically no unemployment, because yeah, it's a, a natural unemployment, we call it, when I was, when I was teaching. Uh, so, it's not really hard to understand the disparity between the two, uh, but I think that the way to uh, even a playing field is businesses itself, and that's why we need important uh, organizations uh, to, that cater strictly to minority businesses so they can even up the, the playing field. Um, you know, loans, money, grants, I, I like money that I don't have to pay back, so that's, that's all about grants. We need, you know, minority businesses need grants, we need resources, given to us um, because that is, uh, that's uh, actually the opposite of uh, what happened in the past, which was resources taken from us, right? So why should we have to borrow money now when, you know, they didn't borrow lab labor during slave slavery, so uh, I think that we actually should put, put money and resources, uh, uh, give them to minority businesses, but it does not have to be 
in the form of a check necessarily. It can be uh, event space, it can be business space, it can be computers and conference rooms, it can be somewhere for you to meet your clientele and for you to uh, present your business uh, as being uh, you know, more uh, credible so that that sale can be easier to complete. I think that's what minority businesses need. We don't really need handouts either. What we really need is just basic resources that uh, other, I guess, majority businesses, that the opposite of minority businesses, I don't know. But other businesses uh, can uh, enjoy that they actually naturally get with the system that we are working in. So I think it, uh, those organizations are needed because we need dedicated uh, resources to minority businesses so that they can uh, properly compete with even small businesses. You know, minority businesses uh, are, are are on an uneven playing field with small businesses, just as small businesses are on an uneven playing field with big corporations. So, so if I may, let me ask just a clarification point. So, if so, a business owner goes for a business loan, um, then are you saying a black business, like there should be some sort of uh, subsidy or some of that granted because it's a black business, or do they apply for a loan the same way their white counterpart applies for a loan? Well, I really did separate my business plan between white and black necessarily. <laughs> uh, I, I represent Petersburg, and we all have the same problems, whether whether white or black. We're about maybe 75% black. So, of course, the issues that occur in Petersburg uh, uh, disproportionately affect uh, our black population there. But, uh, no, I wouldn't necessarily say, like, it should be any type of affirmative action type of policy okay. where if you are black and own a business, you automatically get Money. I think that we should give the resources out even, evenly to everybody and have the same qualifications uh, and requirements of everyone. But if you properly set the, the qualifications and requirements up in the way that uh, it will be most helpful to minority businesses, <coughs> but it can still be, you know, utilized by all businesses. But you know, why would uh, a business who can afford office space go utilize a co-working space when they can afford that whole office? But not to say that they're not allowed in the co-working space, but they wouldn't really have much of a need so we can avail that space to more minority businesses. Right. And early minority business growth, how are you going to tackle it? Sure. So uh, there are a lot of ways to go about it. One thing we were talking about earlier, uh, and I'm just going to start again with the skill component, because of, of, of what you saw in the history of the United States was for a very long time. You know, and, and Waylon hasn't touched on it, but I know he's going to because he, cause even though he's an independent, he considers himself, uh, you know, almost like a reincarnate of the readjuster party. He's a readjuster. That's what you would call yourself, right? And it was based out of Petersburg and grew out of Petersburg. And I'll let you get into more of that later. But with that came the most rapid amount of uh, marginal gain and success in the history of the United States for, uh, at the time, uh, free uh, black folks down in Petersburg, but also in Virginia generally. And Yeah, right. And so with that though you saw a lot of skilled folks who now were had franchise. You know, they were free. And so with that you had folks that were engineers and carpenters and wood and, and you know iron workers. A, a skilled workforce and it was in dire need because the country was building and so with that you have autonomy. So I'm an attorney. I, I have a professional certification. I can go out, and I did last year. I started my own firm. If you go out and you're a carpenter, um, you were a contractor, once you become a general contractor, you can start your own business. It's a sense of autonomy and independence, the same way with HVAC. You know, you can go do your own thing, coding, things of that nature. Um, but if you're just relegated to some liberal arts degree, you're at the disposal of some larger corporate structure. Um, and with that, I think uh, no matter who, and this is both, this isn't just minority businesses, this is just people in general. Uh, independence needs to be instilled in all, all people, a sense of career autonomy. That's why I was talking about earlier skills going into jobs. Right now there's a stigma, but if everybody has to get one before they graduate, there's no longer a stigma about going to vocational school because everybody had to do it. So that's one. Two, um, you know, you're talking about the criminal justice system. Uh, I'm a proponent of banning the box. I think that uh, you know it's been done at the state level. I think it needs to be done in the private sector. And and this actually runs a little counter to counterintuitive to like these free market principles. Some people would say, oh, 
Elliot, you're free market, you're libertarian. How let the private company ask whatever questions they want? What they don't realize is the box is a state-created construct. If you criminalize people's activity, just because they violate a, a, a law, the state created that law. Now, some people say, well, murder's always been a crime, robbery's always been a crime. Yeah, but what about these regulatory crimes? Like, you know, you didn't go out and get your license uh, updated enough, but you're driving on the road. That doesn't inherently hurt anybody. You know, you didn't get in a car accident, you didn't go speeding, but you didn't do some regulation thing, and now you're in the system, right? These things are keeping people from getting hired. I think we should automatically expunge people's records when they're found not guilty. You know, it still shows up on a record that you were charged in the first place. I think that uh, you talk about occupational licensing, and, and not just being in the box, but there's also certain uh, licenses you can't get if you're convicted of certain crimes. I think that, that the state needs to reassess that. Um, so those are, those are things that disproportionately impact the minority community. And then um, at, at the end of the day, <coughs> folks in minority communities who make money need to have easier routes of lending to other folks who want to build businesses in the minority community. Rather than having to jump through the proverbial hoops that have always been there for creditors, like banks, there's high regulations to lend money out there. And lending money doesn't just mean you're going to get an interest payment. Very often, they have a vested interest in seeing your business grow. So if five local business people in the minority community are succeeding, and, and, and then somebody like Julian comes up with a juice company, he's like, hey, I need a loan, right? They're going to want to see the business plan. They're going to want to lend the money. They're going to want to help you out. And some people say, well, they can already do that. But at a certain point, depending on the threshold of money or the, the scope of the account, they can't do that. You've got to get securities. you got you got to get all these different licenses and regs. Those need to be reduced so that I think lending and growth can happen in the minority community at a faster rate. So, and one, one point I would want you to um, to go a little more in, in depth on is as far as when we look at the free market and or if we look at parties who may may overregulate. Um, when it comes to business growth, like what can be done about minorities being denied loans or not being approved for the most? Because on one side you would say, well, I need more regulation for that. On the free market side, they'll say, like, who's policing on the free market side? So, right. so what can we do about minority business loans being denied or not being looked at with the same qualifications? Right. Um, you know, in that, in that regard, you, you see the government, it's not totally free market. Federal government effectively runs every bank. You've got the Fed, you've got the FDIC insured component. They've got to jump through a lot of hoops. The government is fully vested and involved in the seven largest banks. Seven largest banks pretty much have all the wealth as far as public lending is concerned. We need to have fair practices in the sense that I, I would love to see just blind applications. Meaning, you know, we, we, you see it in hiring practices where people discriminate based on name based on other things. That's actually one negative ramification for banning the box. Some people don't know, but I, I'm still in favor of banning the box, and I'm digressing. But they say if you ban the box idea, people just start discriminating based on stereotypes, other stereotypes, and then it's actually broader than people think. Same thing goes with hiring practices based on you know more um, cultural or ethnically based names rather than some traditional, like, just like John Smith or something like that. You know, you find more uh, ethnic sounding names or foreign sounding names, that, that discrimination happens. That also happens in credit applications. And, and I think to your point, I would, I, this is probably more of a federal thing, but I would love to consider pursuing ways to go about it the state way, which is blinding it out so that people are being looked at on their merits. You know, what is it you're trying to start? What is it you're trying to do? But I think we're over relying on the public banking sector, the seven banks, you know, I can name them all, but I think we're over relying on that. I think private equity, I think it needs to come from the bottom up. And that's why I was saying I think we need to support businesses lending to other businesses because then you have a vested community interest in folks at Royalty Eats going down to the barbershop at the end of the strip and then going to this gas station. That way people are building on the way up rather than relying on New York City money or Washington, D.C. I, I agree. And it's funny because if you look at just what we've been talking about for the last 10 to 15 years, uh, minutes about the problems that we face uh, as a community is in our hiring practices, right? Ban the box and uh, or even uh, lend the practices to, you know, uh, uh, fund your small business. But I think that, you know, we can bypass these problems because they're really secondary if 
we push more of our own community members to start their own businesses. Because once they start their own businesses, you know, it might be a micro business for the first five minutes, for the first five years or whatnot, five or ten years, but eventually you're going to reach a threshold where you start, you start to hire your own workforce. And once you start to hire your own workforce, you might naturally understand, you know, that the, uh, uh, the job candidates that come in your door might have the same issues that you face in your community because he's from that same community. So we would not have to regulate current companies, existing companies, to change their uh, hiring practices if we encourage new employers, uh, new people to become employers. Good evening, everyone. Uh, my name is Karan Kaffee Lenoir. I am new to Charlottesville. This is my first official event. Is oh, anything other than a mother here? Welcome. So, <laughs> thank you. Um, I am originally from Baltimore. Okay. I've lived for the last 10 years in Charlotte, North Carolina. Um, but I have worked and lived all over the country. So my question is about me. It's all about me right now. Right? <laughs> um, I am a woman. I am black. I am an entrepreneur. I am a mother. I'm a grandmother. I have a lot of things going on. But I've always been a business owner. I want to know from you why I'm here. First of all, I'm here because I'm supporting my daughter in her own promotion. She's moving forward in her career. I'm here to support her in doing that. Yay, awesome. Here in the city of Charlottesville. Here in the city of Charlottesville. Um, there's literally a blank slate for me. My question is why should I move my business to Charlottesville? And why should I consider this a place for me and my family as a permanent home? What can you do for me as a multiple threat? I'm a woman, I'm black, I'm an entrepreneur, I am a disabled veteran, I'm a decorated veteran. I want to know what you got here for me. Let's give a round of applause for one of our veterans. And of course, being a strong black woman, of course. <laughs> well, I know Elliot's going to take this, but I'm going to plug in. Since you're here, come down to Petersburg. You know, oh, 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 it's oh, a yeah. great place, and you probably will love it. <laughs> um, and, and maybe I, I missed it. What, what type of business do you have? Uh, because, I mean, it might not matter to the answer, but it, it's somewhat relevant as far as moving it to the city. You know? Well, it might frighten you. No, it doesn't frighten me. Okay, I'm pro any business. I'm a journalist by trade. I'm an investigative journalist. Okay. Um, but yeah. I also well, then you definitely <laughs> need to come to Charlottesville. No, I tell you, I mean, just for the market. I mean, honestly. Yeah. And, and I know that you were describing your... There are no brown people on the news. Well, I know. None. I know. Well, not just that. They're also not prosecuting people. I've tried to encourage getting um, minority prosecutors in both the county and the city. I'm yeah. a defense attorney, and most of the time when people become judges, they're usually coming from the prosecution side. Right. If you want to see a more uh, minorities on the bench, you got to get minorities in, into the, in the system. If you get law school right here, there's no reason why we're not feeding in at least the summer Absolutely. associate every year. So, with that being said, though, for what you do, um, Outside of the journalist component and how this is kind of a hotbed that something should be investigated, um, ultimately, I would say, you know, this is an environment that um, has a lot of resources. Um, you've obviously got the university, which can help promote, and, and you serve as a platform for a lot of things if you make, if you kind of break into that area and, and reach out to folk. We don't have a journalism school, but in the future, really? we do not. Um, I did not know that. But it's actually something that people have talked about for a very long time, given that Katie Kirk was one of the, you know, one of the graduates. And we've got a lot of folks that major in other things, but go into that space. Uh, over time, I think it's something that we very well may see here. But I'll note that, uh, you know, we're close to D.C., we're close to Richmond, we're here in Charlottesville, and we have a disproportionate amount of high-profile issues that kind of come out, come out of the area. Yeah. But I think that we live in a time over the past two to three years where, um, you know, being a minority in the area is something that um, any disproportionate impacting issue is now being elevated, hopefully, a little bit more. Um, you see things like the law enforcement, the Civilian Review Board is now something that's being discussed. That wasn't happening 10 years ago, but here we are three years 
later, I mean, three years ago, it starts being talked about. Now they finally got bylaws on the way. Um, we've got um, um, minority representatives, in fact, black women in several positions of power, whether it be the mayor, the superintendent, the chief of police. You know, in, in the sense that we have the highest uh, amount of minority representation in government for a very long time. So I think there are a lot of opportunities, whether it be for you or your daughter or your family, um, to enter into the community and enter into that communal conversation. And you're bringing a perspective from the South, you said you were in Charlotte, um, but before that you said you were in Baltimore. So these are like regional... And Mark Texas. Oh, well, Texas is... And the Midwest. Okay, yeah. I've been all over. My, my question is about the efficacy. What is, what is, what is the benefit of someone like me, who has a vast experience, but no ties, to come to a place like Charlottesville, and to invest my business in a place like Charlottesville. Well, I, well I, I'm going to piggyback off of something Charles was mentioning earlier. Okay. I do think um, our Chamber of Commerce is doing its best to, um, as of late, try to promote minority business growth, and bring people that might not even be from here, but just moved here and want to start something, to give them a platform to be a springboard. I also think that you've got a lot of folks with roots already here who are looking to help and grow and promote, cross-promote in the in the minority business space. So you very well, and it doesn't have to be minority business owners, you've got plenty of white business owners that also want to help in that space. And what it is that you do, I think this area has a lot of uh, passion and, and uh, uh, dedication to journalism. So I think that you would definitely find a home as far as uh, a journalist community that would want to welcome you here as well. I don't know about you, but I just heard the opportunity for your business. You know, journalism school. You get on campus and start a club, and then that's just free labor. <laughs> <laughs> All right, so thank you. So, so to keep it moving, since we, since we actually started getting into the uh, criminal justice reform, I'm going to go into that question. I know that's, that's a hot topic um, as well, some of these two are passionate about. Um, so when it comes to criminal justice reform, uh, for this area, um, blacks are over half of, of, of those that the city accounted for as being arrested and uh, five times more likely to be pulled over or profiled in some sort of way. And that stat's coming from our city's police department. All right, so we know there's an issue. Um, I know that the Whalen has been outspoken, I think both these gentlemen have been outspoken about, about uh, the, the benefits of the legalization of, of marijuana, for instance. Um, so, to you gentlemen, what do you feel is the root of, of our disparities with, with our criminal justice? And what reform do you feel is needed and that you would want to see legislation, or you would present legislation to be passed on? Elliot, as a criminal defense attorney, you can definitely speak uh, more towards this uh, as far as uh, this disparity is actually in the criminal justice system. I, I really just uh, think that uh, we need to find ways to prevent our community members from entering the criminal, criminal justice system. And that is by way of uh, getting a proper education. You know, education is a uh, great equalizer. Uh, owning a business, of course, you want to stay out of trouble, so you have to stay out of jail so you can make your money, right? Uh, uh, unless you plan on doing it inside the jail, which <laughs> 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 uh, uh, Yeah, so I think prevention and then re-entry is very important. Elliot can speak to the things that actually go on inside the system and the courtroom and things like that, but while we're in the com community, we need to prevent uh, people going to uh, uh, get a record in the first place, and if they do so happen to get caught up in the criminal justice system, we have to give them resources to be properly acclimated back into society so they won't be pushed towards uh, uh, that uh, activity again that landed them there. Also, like you said, we have to we have to watch what we criminalize. We can't criminalize activity that is a that is habitual to a population like mar uh, like marijuana, uh, and we can't criminalize them and then go round up everybody who already have that habit, right? That's basically unfair. So that goes to who are the prosecutors? You know, who are the lawmakers? That's why we need to elect more people like me and Elliot. So we have a different understanding than the 70, 80 year old, mostly white, maybe some black, maybe some different nationalities, uh, uh, 
legislators who really have found it uh, harder to relate to the things that we experience in our community. I think that uh, to really tackle criminal justice uh, reform, we need to uh, tackle uh, the problems around, you know, why are we disproportionately sending black people, uh, black young males uh, uh, particularly, to jail uh, for doing the same type of activities uh, as you know, everyone else, their counterparts. Um, I, this touches on my lit earlier yesterday. I spent half an hour over in one of the local jails talking to a 19 year old client who's facing felonies. And the guy in the car was a client I represented who had already been deemed a felon prior to that. And both 19. And I'm thinking to myself, you're in the system now at 19. You don't get out of that. It's tough to break out of that system. Um, and there are a lot of things historically that have led to where we are today. You're talking about the statistics. Um, you know, crime happens regardless of race, uh, regardless of location. It's just a matter of what type of crime it is that most likely to get caught. And so uh, you can find very high poverty rates in places like Hazard, Kentucky that are extremely white areas, but the crime rates are through the roof um, due to drugs, violence, things like that. Poverty begets certain uh, crimes of uh, addiction, opportunity, gangs, and certain things like that where it sets in and then it leads to higher rates of violence, and then violent crimes are more likely to get caught. What happens with that is you get over-policing. When you get over-policing, you get stereotyping, and then you're getting driving while black, you know, you're getting the DWBs, you're getting the stops and frisks, and, and even though the, it just looks suspicious, and what, I, what always gets me is the odor of marijuana. The odor of marijuana has gotten into more people's backpacks, trunks of their cars, their, their passengers' back purses, than anything else, because you can follow the odor of marijuana into any nook and cranny into a car if you're the police officer. So the day that that gets legalized, you've now taken off one of the number one ways of investigation. Now, I'll also note that, you know, this, Michelle Alexander has a great book called The New Jim Crow. There are plenty of books about how we got to where we are. This isn't something that happened last decade. It didn't just happen in the 80s. It, uh, you know, it, it didn't just happen in the 60s. It's been going on since the history of the United States. Uh, there was a time when here in Virginia, and I've already committed the first bill I introduced is to get rid of the death penalty. There was a time in Virginia where there were 80 capital murder crime, capital punishable crimes for a young black man, but only two for a white man. So, and that was in the 1700s, right? So, the fact is, is this disproportional thing has been going on since dawn. As far as local issues, um, there, there are things that, as long as our police force can be more aware, uh, they can be trained. I would love to see uh, people encouraged to actually enter into law enforcement um, so from the community. I would like to see our law enforcement be able to get a stipend to live in the community so their kids grow up together, they see each other, they know each other, rather than being uh, strangers. Because when you're strangers, you start applying misconceptions about people, and then it can lead to higher and higher statistical uh, issues. A lot of our law enforcement lives out in Atlanta or Louisa or Green, and they say it's due to cost of living, but when you're recruiting from those areas, they might not, you, you don't know your neighbor, you don't know what's going on, you don't know who lives, you know, three blocks down. You, you start getting strangers policing aggressive laws aggressively, and then you end up with a system where you don't have adequate representation. I can talk about criminal justice reform all day, um, but you, you specifically were talking about these, these numbers. I know that I think this is more of a statement. No, I, don't need it. I think this is more Carl Brown. Um, I think it's more of a statement than it is uh, a question. Um, one of the things we have to understand as a whole is competency. Um, just understanding color. I don't care what color. Understanding law itself. So the current book, the law book. So I've worked in the criminal justice and I've been proud. So I left the criminal justice just because I learned enough about the criminal justice system to understand it. I probably need to do what I said on the other side because of what I understood. All right, so our car 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 criminal justice book dates back, the code book is 1950. So when you, in terms of talking about uh, legal searches and things of like that, your biggest obstacle is changing the law on the book. It's not making a big issue 
wants something that's occurred because the book is already written. When, the, when, when a judge, a lawyer, they're going to refer to the book of law for the state of Virginia, for the state of California. Now, many other states like Colorado who have changed their marijuana laws, if you look on their book, they had a law like everybody else that marijuana was illegal, but we changed the book. In terms of how you change that, it's very important that we understand when you are putting people in position of power, such as uh, Elliot or yourself, um, you need to be dedicated to understanding that I need you to change this on the book. I don't need you to go and do a big hadoo about where well, they're doing this, they're doing that. Well, they can do that because it's on the book. And so discretionary, that becomes discretion the, the officer and, and the situation. So it doesn't become about what is actual. What's actual is we need to change Law. So you want individuals who understand that this was the, on the book, 1950. The book goes back to 1950. They amend certain things. Most people would like to think that our driver's license law or the driver's license amendment, because it's not a law, the driver's license amendment to get people to get their license back is now law. That could change again back in July 1 if they take that amendment off the book. That's not a law. That's just an amendment. You understand? So I think competency is a big thing that we need to hold individuals accountable for when we are talking about who we're going to elect, what we're talking about. It's good. I see Sean Smith has been big on, uh, and a lot of the stuff we've dealt with has been rah rah. It has no substance. One of the things I knew prior to the statute was you can't change that because that's a state law. It's not a local law. So you can't go and say we're going to move it because the state put it. So you got to go and get your individual who you send to the Senate, to the House, and say, the first thing I want you to do, if I'm going to support you, is you need to go to them. It's your responsibility because it came from them for you to go to the, be on the floor and say, my community would like these statues in the community move. What can we do about that? So I think competency in all individuals is to understand it. I think too often color becomes a barrier, minority, that's okay. But if we start changing what's on the book, right. some of that stuff is going to subside okay. because marijuana is off the books now. So if you do smell like marijuana, where it's not, we got it off the book, so it doesn't impact. Gosh, yeah, no, no, that was one of the things that Elliot was saying. So, but gentlemen, as far as, I'll get to you as well, but um, as far as, uh, uh, you know, expounding on that, yeah. um, some methods that, that you all would take um, in, in order to, you know, to introduce a bill and get that passed, what, what are some of the methods you would do to change the bill? So you're asking, uh, you said the word method. You're not asking which laws I would change. You're asking how I would leverage my position well, to be able to get it, be able to get it done. Um, I'll give you a few of that off the top I would, I would do. We were talking about marijuana, obviously. I was talking about expunging a not guilty finding. I think that, um, I think, you know, you should automatically get your voter rights back once you're released. I think that, um, uh, you know, something as big as the death penalty should be gone. But I also think nonviolent felons should be able to get their gun rights back right away. Um, if, if, because if you look at when those laws were put in 1961, violent felons had lost their gun rights for 50 years prior to that. Nobody had a problem with that. 1961, same year Strom Thurmond's put in the stars and bars up and down in South Carolina, they're taking guns away from nonviolent felons. It's a fundamental liberty to be able to protect yourself. And if you're in a community that might be disproportionately lower means, which has disproportionately higher violent uh, crime rates, you, the law-abiding citizens or nonviolent citizens need to be able to protect themselves. I don't care if you bounce a bad check, it, you need to be able to defend your kids in your house. Yet, when you put guns in these areas, you now create an entire new class of felon with five-year mandatory minimums for no reason other than the fact that they might want to defend themselves. But because they bounce a bad check over $200, they got grand larceny charged, and next thing you know, they can't defend a wife and kids in a neighborhood that might be crime in. That's the type of law I would take off the books, change the book. I would love to change the book. That's the number one way to go about it. Now, as far as the means of doing it, I'm running as an independent. Wayland's running as an independent. We live at a very vital time right now in the General Assembly. There are 21 Republicans, 19 Democrats, okay? If either of us wins, we're probably going to be looking at a 20, 20, 19, and 1. Or it could be 19, 19, and 2 if we both win. Right? As far as who's over here? Who's in this third block? You can now leverage. Now, we're going to catch hell from both parties. They're going to treat us like dogs until, until they need our vote. Until they need our vote on something. 
And that's when we sit down and we come to the table and we say, cool, all right, I know you didn't put me on any of the committees I wanted to be on, and I know that you're not giving me any of the money that I need to get reelected. But I took that burden, but you need me to vote for X. I'm going to come at you with Y, and here are five lists of demands. These are five walls that need to come off the books. And we leverage our position outside of the party to both parties to say, y'all need to figure it out. Meanwhile, we can build coalitions. I know Republicans that want to do a lot of these things, and I know Democrats that want to do the same things. But they don't feel like they can work together. We, as independents, can be that intermediary to say, look, Sally Hudson wants to do this, and uh, you know, Todd Gilbert up in Sh Shenandoah wants to do this. They would never publicly say that, but now with an independent in the middle, they might be able to join us together. I agree. It's all about leveraging. And I, I can tell you, I don't want to say too much to like get the election, but I'll go ahead and say it. Nobody can count on me for any vote until we legalize marijuana. That will be the first thing that I'm gonna I'm gonna vote to pass. If we're not gonna do that the first year, then I'm not gonna be a reliable for any vote. I don't care if you were giving giving your grandmother uh, uh, you know a, a um, uh, what they call it, a resolution of, yeah, 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 yeah. non-binding, like, congratulatory resolution. I'm going to vote no on your grandmother until we, until we pass the marijuana resolution. And that's what, what, really what we need uh, in, the, in the Senate is wild cards. I'm going to be a wild card. I'm not going to be dependable or reliable to anybody except for the constituents of the 16th District, and I'm proud of that. So that's what we need to do, leverage. I want to say... Um, one thing about uh, gun rights for uh, non-valid ex-felons. Not only do you know should they be able to protect themselves after they might commit you know a, a felony and you know they serve their time, they receive their civil rights back, but you know after you, you lose your civil rights, you get your voting rights back and your right to be a public uh, a notary and to run for office. You get all your rights back except for gun rights. Um, and the reason why that's so uh, is such a problem is because uh, you can actually violate uh, by being around somebody else with a gun, whether you know they have a gun or not. I did not even believe this when I started. When I came back to Pittsburgh about two years ago uh, from college, and t just talking to uh, my friends and peers over the last couple of years, I corrected them incorrectly. I was incorrect, but I was correcting them like, no, you you can't get in trouble by being around somebody else with a gun in their pocket and you don't know they have a gun. They were like, yes, I know people. We was riding in the car, they were riding in the car with somebody, the police pulled them over, they found the gun in somebody else's possession and they were violated and sent back to jail. I, just, I had to look it up and research it and make sure that I could actually, like, this was the truth and it is. And that's why I called for automatic, uh, uh, automatic, um, Reinstatement of your gun rights after a certain amount of years for non-valid ex felons because even if you don't want to own a own a gun, even if you don't believe in the Second Amendment yourself, you should be at risk for being around someone else who's taking advantage of their Second Amendment. And uh, the uh, the guy left, but I just wanted to thank him for his words. He's absolutely right. We have to look at you know the the baseline of things. The baseline of the problem is who is deciding what is law. Uh, when we pay attention to who we elect and stop giving incumbents a free pass to just go back and back and back and just uh, strengthen their friendships with the, the you know their donors and the lobbyists, uh, we wouldn't be in as, uh, as big of a problem. We have to you know, seek out candidates young and who's connected to their community and will remain connected to their community. And we have to give them what they, the support they need to you know, be successful, successful in office. Uh, in, in office, so absolutely, we have to look at not only the, you know, externalities and results of bad policy. We have to look at the policy makers and question why are you there. We have to question my opponent. My opponent, what are you? What do you want to do here? Besides, okay, I'm not finish that sentence because it's going to be something negative. What are you there to do besides, you know, uh, commit your own crimes? Right, right, yeah. yeah. That's a good thing. Yeah. So, uh, so hold, if you can hold your questions, please. There's one more topic I want to make sure we at least get to. 
and then we can uh, open up for questions. So we, you know, we can we can definitely stay over the hour time for those who can. But want to make sure that, that we get to the skill development and education topic as well. Um, so uh, we have, uh, you know, a different nonprofits as well to help to help with those things. Like we have Heritage United Builders here in Charlottesville, um, and, and so we look at skills, trades, in our public school systems, right? Um, uh, that's, the, that's one piece that people want to address. Um, whether or not uh, the SOLs should be um, either eliminated or changed in some way, that's, that's one thing. Um, and then of course you have the disparities when it comes to write-ups, um, expulsions of black students versus their white counterparts. Um, there's a 5% there's a state dropout rate. Here locally it's about half of that as far as the average dropout rate. Um, the black graduation rate here is, is about 88% now. So there's 12% who, for whatever reason, do not get a diploma, whether it's failing or dropping out. Um, so those things need to be addressed. But when it comes to, the, to education in general, whether it's skill development or whether it's just our schools, like what, can, what do you plan to do from your level to make school a place where kids will want to be and help them succeed? Let's definitely not forget the, the, the diverse workforce of our educators as well. Um, there's a few things that go into it, and, and again, you know, before I before I answer that, we got folks here who've gone out and started their own businesses, and they're young folks, a lot of different perspectives on these things, and they're not something they teach in K through 12. You know, you might get a, a few certifications or something, but nothing at the level of what's necessary to go out there and start. So a lot of people go into things naive. We're talking about business growth, but it's, it ties into education. Um, the number one thing that I think we got to address is real property-based tax funding, real estate tax-based funding for schools. Um, if you look back at uh, the 50s and, and 60s and before that, you had just segregated schools. And then after that, you had busing. And then after that, you had what was called redlining, which is, you know, certain people live in this area and certain people live in this area. And since then, we've always kind of been trapped. And, and what happens is, is when the real property taxes are what funds the schools, uh, people with means, regardless of race, move to the areas where the schools are better, which then leads to the property values going up, which then leads to more people with means going in that area. Right now, Meriwether Lewis over in Ivy has one black kid in it, 389 students. It didn't used to be like that 10, 20 years ago. But over time, it's a very expensive area. All the teacher's assistants are like professors and doctors and whatever, and they don't even work anymore. Maybe they're stay at home, what have you. They're retired, but at the end of the day, they got the means to be able to have the attention. They call it a public-private because of how much money is in that one district's system. Meanwhile, folks without means might not be able to get out of their particular school if it's a failing school. Maybe they lose accreditation. What I would like to see is education savings accounts come in where if you are at a failing school, if your school has a racial achievement gap above a certain rate, if you are got bad graduation rates, if you're at risk, if you've got behavioral issues, special needs, or you're 300% below the poverty line, a certain amount of funds are going into an account where you could go to a different school if you wanted to. It could be another public school, it could be a private school, it could be a charter school. We have artificially low amount of, we only have eight charters in Virginia. There are more charters in Washington, D.C. than there are in the Commonwealth of Virginia. Um, there's a way to fix that, and that's really down in the weeds, but it's a relatively easy fix. School boards have unilateral autonomy to dictate whether a charter is granted or not. I think at a certain point, if a school board doesn't like competition, they're going to say no. That's why we only have eight. I think somebody else should be able to determine whether or not you get that charter school. But I would like to see the funds used, and it doesn't mean you have to even leave your school. Maybe you're going to use that funds for pre-K. Maybe you're going to use those funds for supplies or tutoring. Or uh, over time, if you never spend them, maybe it'll help offset some college or vocational training. Things of that nature. I want it to compound, and I think those funds can come from alternative revenue sources. We were talking about uh, cannabis earlier. There's other sources. I mean, they say we lose $3 billion a year in revenue to gaming that takes place in our surrounding states. Sports and poker by itself would probably give us $400 million a year in additional revenue. I would gladly put that into education savings accounts for the people I just described so that they can use it for other, other means. 
if the lottery is supposed to be funding our teachers, I think poker and sports could easily be funding uh, education savings accounts for people that really need it. And then as far as the SOLs, uh, yeah, you got to do less testing, less routine. We should have, uh, I think if the school passes at certain rates for a certain period of time, they should probably be able to power down how many times they take those tests. I think the curriculum needs to be more project-based learning rather than just rote facts. I mean, right now, if you memorize a sheet of facts, you didn't learn anything. It's, you got to learn how to learn. And, and then finally, skills. I know I mentioned that earlier. I would love to uh, hear from folks that have started their own businesses, um, you know, any insight, any questions, any thoughts y'all have of how it could be easier to do what it is y'all do. You know, if you are a minority business owner, whether you're a startup or you've been in business for 20 years, how can it be easier for somebody who is 24 to enter into the market and, and what is it that we could do from the state level to help? We're not going to have all the answers. Sometimes there's things that we got to hear. Share my personal story on uh, on uh, not school choice, but just our uh, movement towards uh, standardized testing. And being from Petersburg, we only have one one high school, one middle school, a couple of different elementary schools. But I really start hearing about SOLs around second and third grade. I think we are in uh, we are in a, a good. We are at a good age that we actually live through, you know, this uh, the SOL times, you know. But I went to Petersburg and we weren't accredited probably my whole my whole uh, career in uh, in K twelve. I was in the third grade at Robert E. Lee Elementary School. That's the old name now, which it needs to be changed back if you ask me. But <laughs> I was at uh, Robert E. Lee Elementary School and I hear about these SOLs, SOLs, SOLs. It's so important. You got you got to pass the test, you got to pass the test, or you can fail. And basically, I heard that every single year until I graduated. And it was, I worked at Denny's restaurant, right? And I worked as a serial, uh, it was in the middle of the Tri Cities, is what we called it. So we, uh, we got uh, employees from every different high school in the area, every different city. So a lot of them will come to the Petersburg students and say, Are you not? Is your diploma going to even mean anything? Like, what could you do? And I really didn't even, I didn't actually know how to answer that. Like, uh, I guess. I mean, I'm going off to college, so I don't think any college is denying students because they didn't, uh, they come from an unaccredited school and didn't pass the SOL. Uh, but anyway, I graduated, and that was hard. Like, it, it was hard on me mentally to hear, like, you're going to school for no reason, which is what we heard four years of high school. Like, why are you even going to school? Your diploma is not going to mean anything. So I graduated, you know, I went off to college, and I, I'm, at, I'm where I am now. I think I have a quality education. I look back at my high school education, or my public education, and I do wish that, you know, uh, it was a better learning environment, and uh, with a diff different curriculum, it wasn't so uh, standard uh, learning to the SOLs. But something that I appreciate, uh, I was uh, enrolled in dual enrollment, so I knocked off a whole semester of college while I was in high school. Did not have to pay. I didn't have to take a test as you would in uh, AP classes to receive that credit. So I would say we need to expand programs within high school to make uh, a higher education uh, more affordable and more accessible to uh, students that are still in the, uh, might be in the uh, low uh, income environment and have to go to the high school that you know they are zoned in. Um, of course, skills is what we need to put back into the school so that they can actually have something to start a business with. I talk to a lot of people in Petersburg and around Petersburg, and they say, well, I want to be a business owner. I think that, you know, I see all these people starting businesses, and I want to, you know, take control of my own economic um, situation. And I say, you should. Like, but I don't know what I'm going to do, you know? And that would not be the case if they graduated with a skill, if they knew how to uh, do flooring, or if they knew how to code, or some of the other special skills that you may learn carpentry. 
they can just, you know, we help them apply for a business license and apply to take the, or even pay uh, for them to take the test while they're in their senior year, junior year, if they completed the uh, courses so that they can receive their license and actually go ahead and take your skills straight to the market, start your business. You have something, and if you want to expand from there, or if you want to change to something else, at least you have the entrepreneur experience now that you're not as scared to go out and, you know, jump off that cliff and start your business. I think it's my first. Thank you. Um, you're an attorney, so you know and understand that there's a difference between the letter of the law, the spirit of the law, and who that applies to. 